In today's show, we're going to talk about a biomarker that's more sensitive than LDL cholesterol and indicates your overall metabolic health. It's known as remnant cholesterol. There's a very simple equation that you can use, and we're going to talk about in today's show, about how to measure your remnant cholesterol, both fasting and in non-fasting states. We're going to talk about a recently published paper that is the first paper of its kind to characterize and make associations with elevated levels of remnant cholesterol and the incidence of metabolic syndrome, which is a cluster of interrelated cardiometabolic imbalances that are unfortunately quite common amongst U.S. adults, and actually it's increasing in, in its prevalence in children as well. The title of this paper is Remnant Cholesterol Can Identify Individuals at Higher Risk of Metabolic Syndrome in the General Population. So it's more sensitive than looking at just your LDL cholesterol. And so we'll talk about what uh, remnants are. Now, remnant cholesterol is a highly atherogenic lipid, which includes a variety of lipoproteins such as chylomicron remnants, VLDLs, those are the chylomicron remnants, intermediate density lipoprotein, IDLs, and very low density lipoprotein in a fasted state, also known as triglyceride-rich lipoprotein cholesterol. So what makes the remnants different from LDL cholesterol is that they're triglyceride-enriched, and that is a, a phenomenon that's linked with metabolic dysfunction. So I would like you to go back to your labs that you've run, and if you haven't run them yet, Make sure to get fasted labs first and then do some postprandial non-fasted lipid load testing. We've talked about that in other videos. To make a long story short, you have a standardized meal that you would normally eat that's relatively high in fat, 60 to 70 grams of fat, and you get your blood work done within the two to three hour window after the meal. You don't have to, it doesn't need to be exactly precise. Uh, generally, what I'll do is I'll have like a, a breakfast and then I'll go run my labs about two hours later. So it's within that two to three hour window and the non-fasted comparison to fasted labs, especially looking at remnant cholesterol and also your triglycerides, helps give you an insight into your metabolic health, and we're going to talk more about that. So in recent years, many epidemiological analysis have found that in addition to participating in and mediating the residual risk of cardiovascular disease, remnant cholesterol can be a good assessment for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, diabetes, hypertension, also known as high blood pressure, chronic kidney disease, and a variety of atherosclerosis-related diseases. Diseases. So what exactly is your remnant cholesterol? You take your total cholesterol minus your HDL cholesterol minus your LDL cholesterol. Very simple. Many of you should have access to historical labs to figure this out. Um, just for fun, let's look at my remnant cholesterol in a fasted state. It's 10, which is quite low. Most people that have metabolic syndrome or are at risk for developing metabolic syndrome, fatty liver disease, high blood pressure, and all this sequela linked with cardiometabolic disease have remnant cholesterol in the 30s to 40s. So for fun, let's compare my non-fasted remnant cholesterol to the fasted cholesterol, as I just mentioned. So as you can see here, my non-fasted remnant cholesterol is 32. Now this was having a, actually after having a bulletproof coffee. And so like many of you, I got very excited about the fatty coffees, the butter and the cream and all the stuff and the MCT oils and, and the like. But I found that my blood work wasn't reflecting the fact that having that much liquid fat was actually good for me. So I have since cut back on that. I might have them as a treat. You know, you go to Austin, Texas, and there's this coffee company called Picnic, and I'll have a fatty coffee there. But I'll usually be fasted, and that will be like a, a midday, you know, breakfast or lunch uh, sort of situation. So I'm not having these... Uh, all the time because I was not impressed with what they were doing to my lipid metabolism and overall metabolic health in after having them. So that's why I think it's important to, again, emphasize the fact that you should have a baseline of your fasted triglycerides and LDL cholesterol and ApoB and all that and compare that to a non-fasted state uh, to see your overall fat handling and to help you gauge your overall macronutrient composition after standardizing your protein based upon your lean body mass, as we've talked about with Alan Argon and Dr. Gabrielle Lyon and many other people on these videos. So let's continue and talk about what this study found in the associations with remnant cholesterol, particularly for women. I think this is really important because it turns out that remnant cholesterol elevations are more sensitive in predicting poor metabolic health in women. But first, I just want to thank you for being here. Thanks for hitting that like button. Thanks for leaving a comment below. That really helps people like you get access to this content and these videos to help be more individualized and personalized with it when it comes to their health and 
and nutritional and fitness recommendations. Also, friends, since we're talking a lot about metabolic health, one tool that you might want to be familiar with is berberine hydrochloride. We have many other videos about how berberine works, how it's essentially a probiotic that influences the composition of your gut bacteria and thereby improving metabolic health as a result of that. So the berberine fasting accelerator by Myoscience helps you to increase your fasting-related physiology. There's a, a protein called AMPK that is increased with fasting. Berberine has been shown to improve that. Berberine also may reduce cravings for ultra-processed, hyper-palatable foods that you know to be unhealthy. So if you're susceptible to cravings, having cookies, ice cream, snacks after dinner, you may want to consider two to three capsules of the Berberine Fasting Accelerator after dinner to prevent some of those evening uh, indulgences that can be you know, not productive for supporting metabolic health and body composition. In the description below, I'll link access to the Berberine Fasting Accelerator. You can use the coupon code podcast over at myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com, myoscience with an X, and check out the Berberine Fasting Accelerator. But let's get back to table one here and look at the different uh, quintiles of remnant cholesterol and their associations with waist circumference and with associations and characterizations of metabolic syndrome. As you see here, a low remnant cholesterol under 12, and remember mine fasted was 10. A lot of you listening are probably in that category. You can see here a significant difference with body fat percentage and waist circumference and so forth. But as that remnant cholesterol gets over over 30 up into 180, you can see here strong correlations uh, in this remnant cholesterol quintile with triglyceride elevations, with uh, increased blood pressure, with increased body fat per percentage, uh, triglyceride levels, as I mentioned, and also lower uh, HDL cholesterol levels. So I think it is important to recognize and, and also the strong association with high remnant cholesterol and metabolic syndrome. And I think that's important to recognize because, you know, I think a lot of healthcare practitioners are in tune with the diagnostic criteria of metabolic syndrome, which includes body composition changes, as well as lipid abnormalities and blood glucose abnormalities, as well as uh, blood pressure abnormalities. But uh, this can be an easier to clinically figure out than metabolic syndrome, because you can just quickly do a calculation uh, and there's a strong co-occurrence or association with high remnant cholesterol and metabolic syndrome. And so let's uh, talk about that, particularly as it relates to women. So the scientists say metabolic syndrome is one of the most common chronic non-communicable diseases worldwide. Previous studies have confirmed that atherosclerotic lipid abnormalities were closely related to metabolic syndrome amongst individuals with high triglycerides and LDL, low LDL cholesterol levels, and it's received extensive attention in the past and has become one of the diagnostic criteria of metabolic syndrome. We hypothesize that triglyceride-rich lipoprotein cholesterol, known as remnant cholesterol, may also be closely associated with metabolic syndrome. To clarify the relationship between remnant cholesterol and metabolic syndrome, the current study conducted a systematic analysis of 60,799 adults from different economic sectors. The results showed that a higher remnant cholesterol was independently associated with increased risk for metabolic syndrome and had a high accuracy in the identification of metabolic syndrome. For all I know, this is the first study, and this is, I'm not saying I is in me, the, the author, authors of the study say, for all I know, this is the first study on the association of remnant cholesterol with metabolic syndrome. The high accuracy of remnant cholesterol in identifying metabolic syndrome further provides a powerful tool for risk assessment in the general population. And so that's the whole point of this video, is you now have another tool that you can access on your phone very quickly. Take your total cholesterol, subtract HDL cholesterol, and also subtract LDL cholesterol, and you have your remnant cholesterol. Now you might be saying, well, Mike, this seems confusing. You've been talking about apolipoprotein B. Of course, ApoB is a direct assessment of all of your atherogenic lipoproteins. I think that's important, but you can have a differential with ApoB and your remnant cholesterol. So I think it is important to recognize that this remnant cholesterol number is looking at the triglyceride-enriched atherogenic lipoprotein specifically. With that being said, let's say you have a high ApoB and a low remnant cholesterol. And I think this is where individualization of a low-carb, high-fat diet comes into play. Uh, if you have a high ApoB but a very low remnant cholesterol and you're not eating industrialized seed oils, canola, cottonseed, peanut, uh, all of the, the seed oils that are in fried foods and so forth, and as a side note, over the weekend, I went to a, a restaurant supply store to buy some fermentation crocs. 
and they had these big bags and boxes of all of the fried cooking oil that a lot of the local restaurants actually go to uh, when they're you know buying their raw materials to make the foods that they serve to their customers. All of these uh, pan frying oils, deep frying oils, and, and oils for the fryers, I took pictures of these and I can share these on the screen with you here. Guess what the number one ingredient in, is in these oils? It's soy and canola and cottonseed. So my friends, if you're going out to eat at, at restaurants and so forth, and you think you're being healthy because you're eating a plant-based, whatever the thing is, fried tempeh, for example, or fried soy, you're getting a lot of these, these industrialized seed oils that, as we've talked about in other videos, increase the propensity of your atherogenic lipoproteins to become oxidized and therefore engulfed in your, in, inside the foam cell within your vessels and induce atherosclerosis or plaque. And that's not a good thing. So cook your food at home, go out occasionally, uh, but try to eat most of your foods at home. Uh, without the use of these oils because obviously they are problematic and they are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. A lot of restaurant owners in there buying the oils and I'm sure they're just doing what they know to do out of habit, but we now know that these oils are not healthy. So what are the significant implications from a having a high remnant cholesterol as it relates to cardiometabolic health, particularly for women? The scientists say, notably, in the current study, we also found a significant sex difference in metabolic syndrome risk associated with remnant cholesterol. Compared with men, women have a significantly higher risk of metabolic syndrome related to remnant cholesterol. This sex difference was odd, since the proportion of men in the highest remnant cholesterol group was much higher than that of women. But from the results of this interactive test, the risk of metabolic syndrome related to remnant cholesterol in women was higher than that in men. This is really important to recognize because as women go through menopause, there are significant shifts, obviously, in hormones, a decline in testosterone, a decline in estrogen, progesterone, and that is linked with muscle loss. That is linked with increased adiposity, and that increases the risk for developing metabolic syndrome and the associated uh, metabolic environment that may predispose postmenopausal women to having increased risk for heart disease after menopause. So ladies, make sure that you're, you're doing this calculation on yourself um, and it seems that there is a stronger connection with an elevated remnant cholesterol and risk for metabolic syndrome in women. And the scientists say, the answer to this particular phenomenon may be inspired by the baseline characteristics of the participants. As is seen from the baseline characteristic data in table two that we shared with you, women indeed had lower remnant cholesterol levels compared to men participants with metabolic syndrome. However, their age and body fat percentage was much higher. After further stratifying by age, we found that older women had significantly higher body fat percentage and worse lipid profiles and worse lipid metabolism than men and younger women. According to the survey, the body fat percentage of pre-menopausal women in Spain was about 30%, which is consistent with the results of the current study of young and middle-aged women. Additionally, in the current study, we also found that the prevalence rate of metabolic syndrome in middle-aged and elderly women was much higher than that in young and middle-aged women. And again, this has to do with body fat percentage. So if you think about the overall prevalence in this study of uh, 60,000 individuals, uh, the prevalence of metabolic syndrome in women was under 30 was just 1%, so quite low. And after 30, it's 2.5%. And then after 40, it's 5.9%. And then after 50, it's 12%. And then for women over 60, it's 21%. So you see the shift uh, under 30, it's 0.1%, as I mentioned, or 0.94%. And then over 60, it's 21%. So it goes from basically 1% to 0.1% to almost one in five, so 20%, which is quite a significant shift. And that likely has to do with the changes in hormones uh, after menopause. The scientists say, additionally, with the beginning of menopause, the decline in skeletal muscle mass and strength is accelerated. Blood lipids deteriorate and remnant cholesterol levels are significantly increased, all of which increase insulin resistance, which in turn leads to metabolic syndrome. I think that's so important. Let's just say that one more time. With the beginning of menopause, the decline of skeletal muscle mass and strength is accelerated, and that is linked with the shift and the decline in overall insulin resistance and increase in risk for metabolic syndrome and lipid abnormalities. So they said the quiet part out loud, and that is the importance of skeletal muscle when it comes to metabolic health. And what do we see people, especially people in their 60s and bless their hearts when they go to the gym? Are they lifting weights? Usually, sometimes, sometimes, but most often you see people on the elliptical, on the treadmill, they're reading the newspaper, they're exercising, and that is all good, but there's not a societal level emphasis on the importance of preserving lean muscle mass, especially in the elderly population or postmenopausal women. 
And this is really important because as you lose skeletal muscle mass, there's a decline in your overall metabolic health as we've been talking about. And this is linked with increased risk of the cardiometabolic milieu that fosters cardiovascular disease. And so it's really important to focus on strength training, especially post and perimenopausal women. The scientists say in summary, the main consideration for the higher risk of metabolic syndrome associated with women in the current study may be related to the relative deficiency of estrogen in women. Estrogen replacement therapy has long been considered to play a beneficial role in postmenopausal symptom management. Preventing menopause-related cardiovascular disease risk, osteoporosis, metabolic syndrome, vaginal epithelial thinning, and hot flashes, as well as sleep. And so we do know that women who receive, especially at the onset of menopause, hormone replacement therapy have a reduction in the risk of all sorts of different diseases from osteoporosis to cardiovascular disease to dementia and have a greater quality of life. And so this is why it's great to meet with a hormone specialist around menopause to help support using bioidentical hormones. We know that the Women's Health Initiative study was looking at women taking synthetic progestins and estrogens. These are not bioidentical to your own endogenous hormones. There are complications when you induce a synthetic analog of estrogen or progesterone, i.e., estrogen or progestin. Those analogs have off-target effects that are linked with increased risk of cancer, blood clots, and much more. And so it's really important to differentiate the Women's Health Initiative study and the potential associations with cancer and heart disease because those women in that particular study were using conventional synthetic hormones, not bioidentical hormones, including testosterone as well as DHEA. So it's really important to test your hormones, work with a specialist. I often have my clients that are in menopause and also my male clients work with a hormone specialist if they're over the age of 45, 50, and they have symptoms and hormone imbalances. So really important to consider that. Again, just to summarize here, you calculate your remnant cholesterol by taking your total cholesterol, subtract your HDL, and subtract your LDL cholesterol. Ideally, this number would be under 20, under 25 in a fasted state. And in the post meal state, hopefully it would be under 40. And if, it, if there is a huge differential between uh, fasted and non-fasted, well, then you you have to double down on your lifestyle changes, fasting, feeding uh, protocols, compressing your feeding window, exercise, walking after meals, uh, changing your macronutrients and the like. So hopefully you found this helpful. As always, thanks for tuning in all the way to the very end. Thanks for hitting that like button. Thanks for sharing this as a direct text message and we'll catch you in a future episode down the road. Bye now.